My name is Lisa Walter. I'm an independent photojournalist and I was covering the G20 summit in Toronto for Our Times magazine. It was Sunday, the, uh, the June 26th, and I had the mistaken impression that because it was the Sunday, the last day of the G20 weekend summit, that things would be the kinds of protests, uh, arrests, actions and things, I thought that they would be simmering down and I, I thought really that probably the worst was was gone. So I was going to go to the uh, Toronto East Detention Centre and I was going to, sorry not the Toronto East Detention Centre, the Av Eastern Avenue Detention Centre and I was going to go and see what was happening because I'd heard rumours of arrests outside the detention centre. I got a call from the, uh, from the staff at the Alternative Media Center saying that two of our journalists had gone silent uh, after or during a phone call in which they were reporting on arrests that had taken place at Bloor and St. Thomas. They'd been in the middle of a phone call and suddenly their phones went dead. So I instead went to Bloor and St. Thomas to find out what was going on where two of our journalists were supposed to be and we didn't know if they were safe or that they'd been arrested had no idea what was happening to them. The scene looked pretty calm. You know, people were arrested and they were sitting on the ground. Uh, not a lot seemed to be happening. Uh, officers were standing around and just, there didn't seem to be much action there. But as I arrived, as I got closer to the scene, I found that one of the journalists that uh, I had gone looking for was in the back of a police cruiser and he was looking pretty stunned, pretty uh, just uh, really out of it, uh, in shock, I guess. And uh, his hands were cuffed behind his back and he was in the back of a cruiser. I, uh, I had my video camera with me and a still camera. And I tried to ask him through the open window of the cruiser what was happening, but a police officer intervened and had me step back from the vehicle. I found out from uh, the other journalist who had also been arrested, but she was sitting on the ground with her hands cuffed behind her back, that, uh, that our colleague had been tased, uh, well, we thought initially that he had been beaten. Uh, and uh, I was quite shocked. Uh, it kind of explained his demeanor. Um, but I learned from, uh, from the second journalist that in fact what had happened was that a number of uh, folks from Quebec had been about to board a bus to return to Quebec when they had been stopped by police and arrested as a, as a group. So from there I s tried to, uh, I tried to speak with Amy and uh, the second journalist and I tried to uh, get a statement from one of the officers. Uh, they were, they were not forthcoming. They wouldn't tell me, you know, who they had arrested or why or what was happening. They would, wouldn't give me any information. So they directed me to call the uh, the G20 media office. So I did that and I spoke to someone there and uh, this person wasn't helpful either. Um, in fact what happened was that they asked me, they, they directed me to speak to the officers on the scene and so far that was the, during the events of leading up to that point I had found that that was the pretty stock answer that I got from the media, from the G20 media site. So um, the officers would always say, please call our media office, and the off media office would say, please speak to our officers. So I was feeling a bit frustrated, and, uh, uh, and it seemed very odd to me that the whole, this area which was nowhere near the fence or the protests or anything had been shut down. So it was, uh, it was a strange scene to wander into. There was this strange kind of calm about it all, which just seemed really forced. I was with two colleagues, uh, Ryan and Eli, and uh, one of the officers at the scene uh, told us that we were not welcome and that we had to leave the immediate vicinity. And we told the officer we were going to cross Bloor Street. Um, Eli actually had to leave for another event and he did leave. Uh, I remained with Ryan and we were walking away from the scene of the arrests. We were walking uh, westbound on Bloor Street and we were followed by, I'm not sure how many police officers they were behind us, so I, I don't know how many there were. Um, and uh, one of them made a, a kind of a comment, I didn't catch the whole thing, but it was, it sounded like some kind of a jest. They had been, um, they had been uh, fairly sharp with us, I would say. That, they had tossed a lot of kind of 
uh, comments that I think could most kindly be interpreted as teasing. Um, but, you know, there were really some very really provocative things that they were saying to us. So one of the, as we were leaving, as I was leaving with Ryan, uh, one of the officers said to Ryan something about um, intimidating police. And, you know, neither of us paid any attention to it because we had our backs to them when we were walking away. Um, but, uh, but Ryan, over his shoulder, said, <coughs> uh, said, uh, oh, get off it. You know, you just, like, we didn't even look back. It was so unimportant. And, uh, and then I heard, that's it, he's under arrest. And I look over my shoulder and suddenly there's four police officers on top of Ryan. And uh, I heard this screaming and they were, there were four of them on top of him. And I mean, it wasn't like he offered any resistance. He couldn't have offered any resistance to that kind of uh, takedown, I don't think. But I heard screaming and they were obviously being quite rough with him and I was about 10 feet away and I said, you're hurting him, uh, you know, don't hurt him, he's not resisting. And uh, so then I was arrested also. Um, uh, one of the officers said that I was obstructing police. So I was pretty concerned about that because I know that's a serious charge, but I, I replied to him that I wasn't that I wasn't near them. And my understanding is, is that if you physically interfere with a police officer trying to make an arrest, it can really get you into trouble. But that wasn't the case here because I was actually as far back as I could go, there were some construction barriers and uh, I couldn't get any further away without leaving entirely. But as they were really hurting my colleague, uh, I, I couldn't think of leaving in that moment. But yes, I was then arrested myself and I was I was pushed to the ground by three officers and, uh, and uh, they, uh, they were screaming, it was interesting, they were screaming at me, put your hands behind your back, but one of my arms was under my body and I couldn't get it behind my back because there were so many police officers pressing down on top of me. They finally got my arms and cuffed my, my wrists and then one of them said, is that tight enough for you? And then he squeezed the cuffs about as hard as they could go, so it was cutting my wrist. Um, uh, my glasses had fallen and I said, you know, oh, my glasses. And uh, the officer standing to my left uh, saw, looked for my glasses and saw them and then stood up and crushed them under his foot. Um, then I was pulled to my feet uh, by my wrists in these very tight handcuffs. It was very painful. And uh, I was taken a few steps away when the arresting officer said, oh, I dropped my pen. And so he then pulled me back to the ground using the handcuffs and then dragged me back up to my feet using the handcuffs again. Um, and then I started to get kinds of uh, sexist uh, taunts uh, about my physical appearance, about whether they thought I was a man or I was a woman. So I started uh, being uh, taunted about, you know, about my gender, about potentially my sexual orientation and uh, and there was this kind of unremitting banter directed at me that was uh, that was uh, quite harsh and uh, uh, very offensive and uh, really humiliating. Uh, so it was uh, it was it was disturbing. It was disturbing. Um, they dragged me across the street, uh, searched through my belongings. They found. In my knapsack, they found my first aid kit, and one of the officers said, oh, I told you she was a troublemaker because they found the first aid kit in my knapsack. Um, I, had my, uh, I had my press credentials with me, incidentally, and um, this was before I was arrested. The officers were saying that we had no right to be there, um, and uh, I showed my press credentials, and an officer said, oh, well, they're fake. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, like it was the official G20 pass uh, that accredited me with their alternative media center. And, uh, and he said, oh, well, you know, the other, this other journalist didn't have that. And uh, it wasn't that I thought that having a press pass would, would allow me to stay behind the scenes if they didn't want me. But I did naively believe that if I had press credentials, it would be more obvious that I wasn't there to, 
part in some kind of a protest or a demonstration that I was there to document. And, um, uh, but that, in fact, wasn't the case. They were obviously really uncomfortable with the presence of the media there. Eventually, we were transported to the Eastern Avenue Detention Center. Um, there, uh, it was quite hot, I have to say. Inside the, inside the van, it was stiflingly hot. And once we got on the road, there was some ventilation. But sitting for a half an hour in a tin can on a hot summer's day was uh, quite uncomfortable. Uh, when we got to the detention center, we were driven right into this enormous building. And right away, we could hear the sounds of people who were detained. We, we still were kept in the van for quite a while longer. Um, I hadn't been told why I was arrested, by the way, um, nor had anyone hitherto told me what my rights were or that I, when I would have access to a telephone or to a lawyer. Um, so the people back who, at the Alternative Media Center who had asked me to check in on the scene at Bloor and St. Thomas had no idea that now we had been arrested also. Um, and uh, so we arrived at the detention center and uh, eventually I was moved into a cage that was about, um, about 10 feet by 16 feet is my guess and it looked like it was meant to probably hold about 10 to 15 people. There was, yes, there was a bright orange porta potty in the corner that had no door. Um, there was a steel bench and there was nothing else to sit on and there was about 10 people when I arrived, all women. And as I was there for the next few hours, they continued to add more women and until there were about 25 of us. And at that point, there wasn't enough room for people to sit down, let alone lie down, given that it was, uh, I'd been arrested, I think at around uh, uh, 1.30. By the time we got to the detention center, I think it was about three. I would need to check my notes, but uh, it was the after hours of standing with your hands cuffed because they, they hadn't actually un uncuffed us yet. Um, you know, you get tired standing on your feet. It was very, very cold. And as others have reported, there was nothing to eat or drink. Um, so we kind of took turns alternating sitting on the bench or sitting on the floor. Uh, some women were, were very distressed. People were crying. And throughout the facility, you couldn't see people in other cells, but you could certainly hear them. It was this aircraft hangar-sized space that was reverberating with the sound of this wire mesh being rattled against the steel walls that reinforced each cage. And it was like rolling thunder throughout the facility. And right away, you got the impression that things weren't very good there, because I think the first thing I remember anyone any of the detainees saying was, give us water, there's only this brown water, this isn't clean to drink, we need clean water. And, and women were calling for sanitary pads and people were crying out for food or for water. And uh, when we asked what was happening uh, about the water, we were told that a cart would be coming by and some three hours later a cart did come by for, it, there was a tiny little blue jug and, uh, and there was an officer handing out styrofoam cups half full of water. And there was another officer who was dispensing these little cheese sandwiches. And there was, I can only imagine there were hundreds and hundreds of people in the detention center and this was the sole source of food or water, slowly creeping up and down the aisles with this little cart, handing out tiny quantities of, of water and uh, it was it was scary um, to be, it felt, you felt really, really vulnerable even among other people when you're locked in a cage and your hands are tied, you have no privacy to even perform your basic bodily functions.